a lot of pigeons. Okay, my grandfather. For a kid that like at least dark blue. Yeah. <laughs>
hall right there. Yeah. Here you come, okay. <laughs> What's up there? It's on tape. <laughs> oh, you're right. Oh, you're it's in the all on tape. Oh, okay. What's up? Okay. Slow, 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 slow. That's good. Keep it down, you know. This evening is a celebration of life for Rich Sorrow. Rich would not want us to be hanging around crying. He would like us to be around remembering the good times that we all had with him. Family and friends have so many memories that we will be able to share some of those when we move into the hall for the second part of this program. The program was really broken up into three parts this evening. One was our march through on 17th and Bryant. The day, labor, day laborers program was right up the block. As most of you know, Rich worked throughout this city in trying to make sure that people were able to obtain jobs. But not only jobs, but living wage jobs one jobs that people can afford to raise their family in this city. And the diversity of this crowd this evening reflects the many years that Rich dedicated to all San Franciscans. The second part of the program would be going through a blessing done by Concha Salcedo and also a couple of remarks by some folks here that will be introduced at the time. We will then conclude here and go up into the hall. The hall is set up so that we can all mingle together and share. Uh, we will open up the mic at some point and around eight o'clock, there will be a special presentation done by um, Carnival Samba Group. Rich um, is looking down at it right now and can't wait for it. And um, we'll go from there. And again, once again, thank all of you for coming. I would like to now introduce Concho Salcedo. Buenas noches, good evening. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Rich Soto's uh, family for uh, giving me the honor of uh, being able to participate in a small way. Uh, in honoring a very spectacular human being who had much to teach us in the way he lived his life, in the way he struggled with his life, in the way he made his life a thing of beauty. Uh, I saw it in his children, in all his children and his family. Uh, there was so much love, there was so much love there. Uh, I've been watching them look out for each other and take care of each other. And it tells me that he was a remarkable man because he made that possible in his children, in his male children, as well as in his girl children, and in the grandchildren. Uh, so that tells us the, the measure of this man. 
So uh, I would like to honor him in the tradition of uh, my people uh, using the uh, incense, uh, kopal, which uh, helps our prayers go to the heavens. He's in the stars. He saw the star before he left. He went up to the star heaven. So we should not mourn. We're, we're mourning because we miss him. Uh, he is uh, happy in this other world, in this other nation, and he's seeing everything that's going on here and participating in this celebration with us. So uh, I will ask you to join me and Maquin and Roban in thanking uh, the energies of the four directions and the spirits of four directions who guided his life, whether he knew it or not. They guided his life and helped his life be circular and involve all kinds of people, all kinds of colors from all walks of life. That's what the four directions are about. And they come into the center to make something complete and something balanced. So he left us early, but he left in a balanced way. You know, maybe what he had to do here on this red road on this red earth was complete and now his work is in that other road in that blue sky in those stars so let us thank him for his life that he gave us and thank all creation in all directions so i will ask you to join me in um, saying a prayer however you pray in each direction it is dios in la ketch in la ketch in maya means you are my other self, you are the reflection of me, and it means we are one. So in this circle today, Rich is doing it for us. He's bringing us as one. And I think the best way we can honor and celebrate his life is to continue his work as one for all people. In the kitchen. All members of his family up here. They're coming, right here. It is customary also to pray not only with the drum. The drum is, is the heartbeat of us all, and that is what joins us all together, because all our heartbeats are, are joined with his heartbeat, which is now in, in the universe. So I would like to uh, honor him with a song. You may perhaps any of you know it, and you can join with us. It's a song of springtime. It's a song of flowers and of birds. It's a song of life, and his life was about living life. And the way he left us, he lived to the last moment. So join me, if you will, in De Colores. De Colores, De Colores se viste en los campos en la primavera. De De colores, de colores es el arco iris que vemos lucir. Y por eso los grandes amores de muchos colores me gustan a mí. Me gusta la 
wonderful family, as he was a wonderful man, and I know the struggles to live are going to be hard, but you have a whole circle of people here, a circle of beauty. You have beauty up above you and around you and below you, and you can call, I think, on any one of us for anything. So, Lord, thank you again for the honor. And I hope he was pleased. I think he was pleased with this day. And if you need to be sad, you be sad. If you need to laugh, you laugh. In my case, what we're going to do now, as we talked about, is that we're going to go through some remembrance. And instead of just keeping the mic up here, we are going to give um, the family the uh, first opportunity to share. There are some board members and Supervisor Leal is going to read a proclamation from the mayor. And then we have a mic that we're going to send throughout the crowd. And once we go through this process, again, upstairs we have a jazz band, Rich Love Jazz. Again, we have carnival, we have food, and it's a time for us to share. So what I'd like to do is to introduce his brother, Bill. Hello, Bill. And he'll be the first member of the family. First of all, thanks for everybody being here. Rich was the, uh, the sixth child in our family of eight children, followed by my sister Barbara and I, the youngest. My two sisters, my two sisters and, and brothers, uh, in all my family. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, my two sisters and five brothers were born in the south side of, of, the, of San Francisco in what we call today uh, the South and Market. That when, when we grew up and when we were born there, it was called the south side. Some people call it today uh, Soma. Sometime in the late 1930s, our family moved from the south side to the Fillmore District, where I was born in 1939. And I was born on Webster Street and O'Farrell Street. I'm the, I'm the last of my generation in our family, the only one left. Uh, uh, of all my siblings, they all died. They all died young. Our mother Mary was a native San Franciscan of Spanish and Scotch descent, and our dad Salvador was part of the first major immigration of Filipinos that came to the United States early in, 19, in the 1900s. Our parents met in the Salinas Valley while my dad was working in the fields, and my mother lived with an aunt in Castroville. They were married by the Justice of the Peace in Oakland in 1921. Immediately following their wedding, they took the ferry boat back across the bay to San Francisco. Upon their arrival, my father was arrested by the San Francisco sheriff and charged for white slavery under the anti-miscegenation laws that prohibited men of color from marrying white women. These laws remained on the books unofficially until almost about 1960. My mother's family disowned her for marrying my father. She never forgave him for it. My mother became a staunch fighter for racial equality without ever talking about it, and we children were truly blessed by the strength of my father and the beauty and heritage of our Filipino-American culture and home. <coughs> Rich, Rich, Barbara, and I were the youngest of our family, and we were also very, very close. Brother Rich would never let anything, anything or anybody do harm to Barbara and I, and we always... And we always felt the protection from our brother. He might, what, he might mess with us, and, and sometimes he did, but no one outside our family could, could mess with Barbara and I. Rich had the hottest, had the hottest temper, in, temper in our family, and he also could fight like hell. Even my older, my older brothers, Cal, Sal, and Ray, knew better than to piss Rich off. He was always a fighter. In our family, Rich was, was the athlete. He excelled in any sport he attempted. In the seventh and eighth grade in James Demon Junior High School, Rich was on the all-city track team and broke and set many, many, many records uh, on the track team that remained unbroken for many years. By the ninth grade, he was an all-city shortstop for James Demon baseball team. Rich had potential and could have gone a long way with his skills and, and his talent as, as an athlete. Um, 
He loves sports. Many of you know that about Rich. Rich, we, Rich loved sports. He loved competition. He loved the challenge, and he loved to win. And he knew Richie knew how to win. He was a very bright student, and like many young poor kids of color, he was tracked out of regular schools and never attended high school. He was an independent thinker, and he only gave respect to those who gave respect to him. And in his heart, he was always a rebel, which he continued to be until his last dying breath. The reality is, is that there weren't many institutions or schools around in those days that were capable of recognizing the potential and brilliance of a young man like Rich. He was just a poor brown kid with a bad attitude that ran real fast and was a hell of a baseball player. In the early 1950s, I used to sell papers around San Francisco. And uh, uh, on one Saturday morning, I was hustling papers in the Glen Park District on the, on the corner of Chenery and Diamond. And when I came to get my papers, one of the kids that sold in those days, there were a number of papers, and one of, one of the kids was selling the, the news I sold the call bulletin. And he <laughs> said to me, uh, hey, there's a, there's a picture of a guy that got shot last night by the cops. It looks like your brother. And sure enough, it was Rich. He and a couple of friends had stolen a car the night before, and while they were running from the police in a high-speed ch chase, Rich was shot, in, was shot in the leg. I ran and hid all day. I ran and hid all day crying and thinking that my brother had been killed. Rich recovered from the gunshot wound to his leg, but he never went, was able to play sports at the level that he always played when he was a, a younger, younger man, a younger boy. Soon after Rich's recovery, he joined the United States Army at the request of his probation officer. By his 19th birthday, he was, he was in an artillery battalion up to his young ass neck fighting in Korea. Fortunately, he returned home safely. He returned home safely and soon thereafter met and later, and met and later married Alicia Colombo, a sister here from the Mission District. And out of that first marriage came his first children, his oldest children that are here tonight, Gilbert, Michelle, and Christopher. The, the first three of Rich's nine children. When I was around 17 years old, when I was around 17 years old, I found myself for through, through some unforeseen circumstances, homeless and sleeping in a car in the Filmer, in the Filmer District. Feeling desperate and very ashamed, I called, I called Rich for help. In 10 minutes, he was there. In 10 minutes he was there, threw my bag in the car, and off we went. And for the next year, I lived with him and his new family in a very small apartment in the Sunnyvale Project. He was always there for me. Over the last period of Rich's illness, and later his passing, many people have asked and inquired about the discovery of his illness and the spread of, and the spread of cancer in, throughout his body. We only found out, we only found out the severity of his condi condition really uh, just a short period of time and all of you that know him knew it was it was very quick and, and many of us had no time to adjust to it um, the real facts are is that rich went to went to kaiser hospital and he was dying and, and many of you have seen the placards tonight here <coughs> kaiser diagnosed kaiser diagnosed rich for for an ulcer for over a year and a half and they kept treating him for this ulcer and giving him Maalox and giving those kinds of things that you give an, a, a patient with Maalox. And for two goddamn years, that's how they treated him. And they never once, they never once, you know, extended to him the kind of stuff that you do normally. If somebody comes in and says, you've got pain in your stomach, you've got to say, well, let's, let's, let's do some more treatment. They didn't do that to Rich. And, and it led to many, many things. Uh, I'm pissed off. I'm pissed off at Kaiser, and, and, and I'll never forgive him. I'll never forgive him. Uh, never in that time did they recommend he come in for additional examination or more comprehensive treatment. After the pain became so severe, Rich went to the Veterans Hospital, and there, after the necessary follow-up and, and examinations, they discovered that he, an, he had an inoperable tumor the size, of a golf, the size of a golf ball on his pancreas. What happened to Brother Rich is happening to many patients that are simply, th that are simply throwaways, that are simply throwaways. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's all right. Okay. Uh, Lower the volume of the yeah. as well. Anyway, I'm almost finished. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're simply, 
So what happens to this is what's happened to a lot of people, you know, particularly poor people and working people all over the place. And that, and that rich became, a, became one of the throwaways in, in the medical industry for profit. And, 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 and Rich knew, and as Judy, Judy fought with him and, and, and struggled with him, Rich knew that, Ty, that Kaiser had done him wrong. He, he really knew that, that Kaiser had done him wrong. So in conclusion, what I'd like to say along with my six kids, Django and Daphne and Daisy, Danae, Julio and Joaquin, and my grandkids and my wife, Juliana, I'd like to personally thank all of you, the beautiful friends, sisters and brothers, his wife Judy, and all of you that were in, in, in the, in Rich's family, certainly, for being there for Rich, and, and all you beautiful sisters and brothers that are here tonight, and from the bottom of my heart, and, and, and everybody says, you know, Rich is looking down on it, and especially my brother Richard. Thank you. Um, one of Rich's sons, Clay, and um, he's going to share a poem. But you showed me by it. As my airplane climbed above those dark rainy clouds, I saw a gorgeous sunset. It had reds, yellows, oranges. It had colors that don't even have names. And it was you, and I knew it was you. And I love you, and I thank you, and I know you can hear me, because part of me is speaking. In front of the hiring hall, he's out here. Um, Commissioner Carlota Del Portillo of the San Francisco Unified School District is also a long-term member of their board. And newly appointed Police Commissioner Jim Salinas is also a member of their board. I would like to acknowledge um, Supervisor Alex uh, Leland Yee and Jose Medina, and the young man, um, Ray Del Portillo, the president of the Commission on Age, and he's somewhere out there. Where are you, young man? <laughs> and um, also, uh, if anyone is interested in making donations, they can make them to the Mission, at, mission Hiring Hall, Rich Soro Fund. And at this time, I would like to introduce Supervisor Liao, who will share some words, and also share uh, a proclamation and thereafter would be a representative from super um congresswoman pelosi's office okay. some very uh, moving words from rich's family and i'm i'm very pleased to be here to hear them i uh, I'm here as one of the many representatives of the city's official family. Uh, Mitchell listed some of the people that were here. A number of members of the city's official family turned out tonight because Rich was very important to our community, to our city, and to basically our vibrancy. You mentioned uh, Carlotta Del Portillo of the school board. Um, Chuck Cugaris of the library commission is here. Renan Maragi, Maragi of Councilman Pelosi is here. Uh, Leland Yee, Supervisor Elect is here. Supervisor Elect Jose Medina is here. And uh, I also uh, want to recognize uh, Joe Julian of San Francisco State, who is on the Ethics Commission. And I was just hearing some stories from Joe that uh, he and uh, Rich was, and I'm using Joe's words that he and Rich were uh, hung out together and were a couple of chucos together. So I can, <laughs> So uh, on behalf of the city's official family and the mayor, I just do, would like to read this proclamation and, and give it to Rich's family on behalf of the city. Whereas Rich Soro demonstrated an uncompromising belief in the working people of San Francisco, and whereas Rich Soro had the unique ability to create consensus among San Francisco's diverse community regarding important labor issues, and whereas Rich Soro was a proven leader in resident employment and training in San Francisco for over 30 years, and whereas Rich Soro held to the highest principles of full employment regardless of ethnicity, gender, and racial differences, and whereas on Wednesday, December 11, 1996, Rich Soro died after a brief battle with cancer, leaving his loving wife, Judy, brother Bill, his nine children, and six grandchildren, 
Now there it be resolved that I, Willie L. Brown, Jr., Mayor of the City and County of San Francisco, in honor of the invaluable contributions of Rick Sorrow made to the many communities in our great city, and in memory of an extraordinary life, do I proclaim December 19, 1996, as Rick Sorrow Day in San Francisco. And I'd like to give it to Judy. I would like to um, know if any of the members of this board would like to share before we move on with the program. Carlota, Jim. I will not take too much of your time to tell you of all the <coughs> of all the Rick Soros stories and all the wonderful things that we did together and, and all the discussions that we had. But I do want to acknowledge that many, many a family and many, many a life were protected through his work. And every single time without exception that I picked up the phone and I said, Rich, I have so-and-so here. This person needs a job. This person needs a set of He said, well, just send them on down. We'll take care of them. We'll take care of her, so on. And every single time he was there and he did it. For that, I publicly want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Jim Salinas. Um, I want to thank all of you brothers and sisters uh, for being here with us uh, this evening. Um, we all have family, we all have friends, we have brothers and sisters. I've always felt that Brother Rich was all those things to us. What I loved about Rich was that he came out of this community, never forgot it. Always felt that he could make a difference. God blessed him with a lot of power, a lot of skill. Never used that for himself. That's the thing that I loved most about Rich, that he was cool. He had that, you know, I keep envisioning Rich coming around that corner. Never lost that slide and never lost that glide. I want to, I want all of us to remember him that way. You know, I know he would be uncomfortable with uh, something like this, but he truly deserved uh, this recognition. Uh, if a man, if a brother is to be measured by the caliber of his friends and his family, this brother was a giant and he leaves a great void. Uh, we will never forget him. Uh, his legacy continues. We need all of you to continue to help us to do that. Uh, there's a lot of need in the community and the communities that he loved. Uh, he's still with us. Um, thank you for being here. <laughs> Jim, Jim was um, a great labor supporter, and he also had some great people behind him. And Donna Levitt, um, also would like to share a couple of words. Stan Smith, the Secretary of the San Francisco Building and Construction Trades Council, asked if I could read this because he was unable to be here. The loss of rich sorrow will be felt deeply throughout the labor movement, as well as by all those who knew him on a personal level. Rich was a unique individual who had strong beliefs that workers deserve to be treated with dignity, be paid a decent wage, and receive proper protection in the workplace. Regardless of where Rich went or who he talked to, he put forward those beliefs. I was fortunate enough to count Rich as a personal friend as well as a colleague in the labor movement. I often went to Rich for guidance and support on labor issues. I will miss Rich. He cannot be replaced. Because of rich sorrow, the working people in San Francisco are better off today. So that's a fraternally Stan Smith, Secretary, Treasurer, San Francisco Building Trades Council. I want to add uh, my words of sorrow uh, to Stan. I can't count the number of programs that are in place in this city for working people and 
particularly for young people in the community that we, we owe to Rich. I think of programs with the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency, with the Housing Authority, with the school district. And uh, they're programs that we fought for and that Rich fought for, and there was no more eloquent voice and no stronger and more dedicated of a fighter than Rich to stand up particularly for opportunities for young people in the community to have long-term careers that would bring them dignity and respect. Rich leaves a big void, but he also leaves a legacy. And uh, it, it's a legacy and a model that all of us here, I know, will follow and will benefit because of. Thank you. I would like to bring Ed Newman up from the Filipino community. In the, in, the, in the late 60s, a group of us from the campuses, from SF State and other campuses, decided to go change the world out in the community. We started working the South of Market, and we started working the Mission District, hooking up with groups like Horizons Unlimited, Jesse James and Mission Rebel, RAP, you know, and a lot of other uh, groups. We ran into Richard Sorrell, and here at college, formerly educated people, talking to his brother, who's, who's training up how to organize. And here's the guys who didn't like to write letters, write proposals, but it could get things done. He was a splendid negotiator, and he got changes in the community. He would, he was a dinosaur, like he used to call himself. And he would use his skill as a negotiator, and he would deal from a position of honor and truth. He would remind us that our fathers, many of our fathers, were farm workers to work aside our Chicano brothers. And many of us grew up in the Western Edition. I grew up in the Western Edition, and we had black brothers. So when we talk about organizing the Filipino community, it was like we had to get together with everybody because we had a common goal together. We learned a lot from Rich, and commonality was the greatest lesson. Thank you. When many of us who are here tonight, along with Rich, uh, went through many battles together in the Mission Coalition organization. Rich was very proud to have been a leader in the Mission Coalition organization, and we talked about it all the time when we got together, and we reflected on some of the stuff that we did. And I just wanted to read to you some of Rich's words. Uh, fortunately, Mike Miller, who was the lead organizer uh, during the Mission Coalition days, interviewed Rich earlier this year, and there's some copies of, of this interview that'll, that'll be here tonight that you can take with you. Uh, and I wanted to read one part of it, I think, that says a lot about Rich and about how many of us who uh, went through those battles the, uh, that many years ago, about how many of us feel. This was in response um, to Mike's question about uh, what, how did you do things in the employment committee of, of the Mission Coalition. And, and Rich said, we got things offered to us that you'd never get in any other circumstance. It gave members who had self, low self-esteem a big boost. People saw that they could make changes. They'd never been in a CEO's office before. They'd never done anything like we were doing. We were always in control of ourselves, but we weren't there to make friends. We wanted to make a deal. There's always time to kiss and make up, but if we had to fight, we would. We grew because we kicked ass downtown. Regular neighborhood folks really got off on that stuff. The threat of community action is what got us what we needed. I went into the employment committee with many years of frustration behind me. It was a place where people could vent that frustration, people like me who were fed up with the way we were being treated. You could vent and then move in a positive way. It gave direction to your anger. There was humor, militancy, and craziness. Some situations were really tense, but we never lost our humor. We had an action with Hibernia Bank, the Irish bank in town. No people of color working there. We weren't sure whether we were going to go in there with shamrocks painted brown or tortillas painted green. But we knew we were going to do something humorous. We decided on tortillas and we stood in line to deposit them in the bank. 
we got jobs there. The spirit we created was really contagious. People who got those jobs through the committee would come back to the committee to give something back to the community. People on the street knew about the committee. You knew that this committee was doing something for the people. I learned things in the MCO that I'd never have learned anyplace else. And that goes for me too. <laughs> and Rich and I talked about that a lot too. They worked in other places too. These types of actions worked in other places too. In the South of Market, the Filipino Organizing Committee used some of these tactics as they worked there too. The MCO was people of all races and nationalities who lived in the mission. One employer told us that, we, that he had an affirmative action hiring pro, uh, program and that he couldn't deal with us because of his plan. We told them we're people of all races and colors and we don't care about your program. That style worked. The time was right. Actually, the time is right now. The time is always right. And those were Rich's words about his experience with the Mission Coalition Employment Committee. I want to say one other thing. Uh, it's really a thank you to Rich's family, uh, to everyone in Rich's family, and especially Judy, because a lot of us, you know, who knew Rich for many years, uh, we wanted to be close to Rich near the end. And because of his family, we were able to do that. And I really want to thank them for that because it was very important to many of us. And, you know, to, to go through a process like this with a family who opened up to Rich's friend, I think is very special. And I want to thank you all for that. Before, before I bring on the next person, I want to kind of set the tone for this young man. Um, Larry kind of gave me an, a ramp to say this. Um, as many of you know, violence and youth violence in this community and throughout San Francisco is high. Um, I had an opportunity to work with Rich over the last five years, known Rich for, I guess, for a while, but really didn't know him. But over the last five years, in one particular um, e afternoon, we asked Rich, we said, Rich, we need you to get involved in an economic development committee as a co-chair through the Mission District Community Peace Initiative, which is a strategy to try to reduce youth violence in our community. And like Rich does everything, no problem. And we ensured Rich that if we were able to negotiate anything that involved employment, we would give it to him. And I'm proud to say that after, after passage of Proposition A three years ago, which was a $95 million school bond um, for the city and county of San Francisco, the Mission District was going to get $45 million to rebuild two elementary schools that the Board of Education 25 years ago promised to the Mission. <laughs> and secondly, the rebuilding of John O'Connell. But building schools was as important as jobs. So Rich had worked with Chinese for Affirmative Action, L.A. Hill Hutch, and young community developers through projects through redevelopment. And through much community work through the building and trades, um, through the community and through the school district, the school district had funded something called the Community Workforce Collaborative, which monitored prevailing wage. Rich was committed that people that worked hard got paid a decent wage. Labor was happy with the passing of that prevailing wage with the school district. And Rich brought together his friends throughout the city to implement that project. It was a CPI strategy. And we gave it to Rich because Rich was the best man to do the job. And as most folks out there, particular community folks that run agencies, you know if you had a grant over a million dollars, you'd be fighting for it. But we did not fight with Rich. We gave it to him with dignity and respect, and I had no imagination two years later that I would be standing here as an iron worker, no, a carpenter, excuse me, but Rich was very proud of him, and Mario spoke at their 25th year anniversary. I'd like to share a few words. Um, 
the first when I first met met Rick, I, all I had was a job. You know, I was just working, you know, paycheck after paycheck and when I met Rich, you know, he hooked me up with a job as a carpenter and he told me that I was gonna take a chance that I was just gonna work for like maybe seven months out of the whole year. And I was like, Well, man, how much am I gonna be making? He said, Ten bucks an hour. I said, I'll take it. So anyways, he hooked me up and you know, I took a chance at that time, you know, like when he hooked me up, you know, he just hooked me up with a job and like before that, I had buzzing for like two months though, like straight up. I said, Rich, I need a job, man. I need a career, not a job, a career. Hook me up, hook me up. He hooked me up, man. At the time, it was kind of rough, so that's why it took kind of long. And this is where it first started. This is my first job site right here. This, uh, first, this uh -huh. building that I'm standing right here, talking about Rich, yeah. this is where it first started. I was, you know, it was hardest, it was hardest at first because, you know, all I was doing was like, like cleaning and all that. But I mean, now it's been three and a half years and I'm like almost a journeyman now. I'm making about $20 an hour. You know, I'm making good money, you know, thanks to Rich. I never got to say thanks to Rich because, you know, just by me being a hard worker at work and just showing him what I could do at work and not let him down and get fired. I've been with the same company that I started in this job for three and a half years. It's been a long time. And just by me doing that, you know, that's why, that's how I thank Rich. You know, like, that's how, that's how, like, he looked at it like, okay, like, he just gave me an award, like, last year, around this time, I think, for um, Mission Hiring Hall for the 25th anniversary. I mean, Rich, man, I don't think it's gonna be nobody like Rich, you know? He just helped a lot of homeboys. Homeboys called me up to jail, hey, I'm about to come out of jail, Mario. What's up, you got a job for me? I said, hold on, let me make a phone call. Rich, what's up? I got a homeboy coming out from, you know, from the pen, you know, he needs a job. He's like, hey man, tell him to come down and talk to me. There he goes, Rich, straight hooked him up. Never let me down. You know, of course you're gonna be a little slack, but you know, you know, like when you first come out, you know, like come out of jail, you gotta deal with situ you know, self situated and you know, he, he ain't gonna have it like right hooked up, but he was always there for me. He always hooked every time I asked him to you know, to hook a person up, he was always there for me. And I just talked to him last week and I talked to him personally right before he left. Right before he left this and I got to say a few little things like that I'll never forget him from behind my life. I, I, I mean, I thank him and everything. And I don't even know what to say no more. It's just, that's how life is, you know, but he's just, man, he's a wonderful person. You know, I love Rich. Man, he just, I don't, I don't even know. He just, I don't even know. He just. There's people that want to acknowledge Rick, and uh, we have another proclamation from the redevelopment, and I'd like to introduce Clifford Grace. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, you've heard a lot about Rich, and uh, his relationship with the redevelopment agency goes back many, many years. I'm relatively new in town, so I don't have quite the homeboy stories that you've heard from others. But I'd like to make a couple of observations. You've heard him described in ways that ring a bell with me, and that's how cool he is. And as I learned from others at the agency, from Leroy King, about what Rich has done and how he got it done in this community over the years, the fact that his, as Mitch said, his pants were always pressed and his hair was all in place, that's a characteristic to be envied. But he was a real partner and a friend to the agency because while at the redevelopment agency there are things we want to do, we have to have partners who know how to get it done. And Rich always seemed to get things done. The, uh, the record of employment of uh, area residents and the construction jobs and the operating jobs in our project area, Rich is alleged at the agency. There are, I've noticed a couple of dozen agency employees here who've worked with him at one time or another. I'm not going to read the proclamation that was passed by the uh, redevelopment commissioners on Tuesday, but only to say that uh, there is a very big hole in our team right now because of uh, uh, Rich is going to be hard to replace. But as you've heard, there are a lot of people that he's brought up and we're looking forward to working with them too. So 
to his friends, to his family, and to his colleagues. We wish you all well, and we share a great loss. Thank you. It's getting kind of cold out here, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through two more presentations. We're going to go upstairs, and then we can do some more remembrance and have some music and relax a bit. I'd like to introduce the president of the San Francisco Labor Council, Josie Mooney. When I first got my first organizing job in 1975, the director of the Electricity and Gas for People campaign said to me, you want to be an organizer? I said, yeah, I really want to be an organizer. And Mike said to me, then be like Rich Soro. Well, it took about 10 more years before I ever met Rich Soro. But when I did, I knew what Mike was talking about because he's the kind of organizer who cared about all of us, whether or not you had money or whether or not you didn't, whether or not you were African American or Latino or Asian or white, whether or not you were a man or a woman, didn't care about your gender, didn't care about your sexual orientation. He was a man who reached deep into everyone's eyes and soul and then agitated them so they'd get moving, take some action, get some change, and organize. Recently, since I've been the president of the Labor Council, it's occurred to us that we've needed friends in other places. And Rich was always one of those friends in other places because he was everywhere. Everywhere I went, there was Rich Soro, saying, hang in there, baby, you can do it. We're all in this together. I've not known a finer trade unionist than Rich Soro, and he worked at one time in his life for the Service Employees International Union, which is my union. I've not known someone who worked harder for people to get a job, not just any job, but a decent paying, benefited job on which you could support a family and have a decent home in a city that we all love. And I've not known anybody who worked harder for people who couldn't find a job to get a job both those who were organized and those who weren't organized. So I guess the thing I want to say is that when God made Rich Thoreau, she didn't do anything else that day. Carol Zadina and Supervisor Lett. Okay. Uh, Rich and I worked many of the same streets for many years, uh, south of Market. I also, uh, I first got to know Rich uh, when I had a son in the Mission Child Care Consortium, and I was impressed and amazed at the energy that he put out on behalf of the Mission Child Care Consortium, and that was constant of the effort that he put out for everything that he got involved in. I mean, there was no holding back. It was all out uh, to do everything that he could uh, because he wanted to benefit the community right up to the end, and he gave his life right up to the end uh, to better serve the community. And when Mitch was talking about what a sharp dresser he was, uh, you know, it brought into mind another friend that we lost recently and how they both contributed to the community in their own way, and that was Ed De La Cruz. Uh, you know, Rich wanted to look good, work hard and everything, and Ed De La Cruz would just very casually went about <laughs> taking care of business in his own way in the community. And those are uh, two friends uh, that I will, you know, miss, that we will all miss because they're irreplaceable, but they have influenced so many people that there's a number of you out there and those of us that are still here that have to carry on uh, the kind of work, the kind of example, the kind of standards that they set for us all out here in the community because they were the heart, spirit, and soul of the community. And so we want to go out there and do everything we can uh, to reflect the kind of dedication and love that they had for this community. Thank you. Yeah. Clay. Yeah, that's true.